Nobody could ever truly assess what the best of an artistic medium as expansive and historical as literature truly are. But lists are fun, and they expose people to new things, creating discussion along the way. I'm far from the most educated person to share my thoughts on this topic, but after spending a few years reading many of the most acclaimed books out there, I wanted to share my thoughts. So here are my top 15 books. Number 15, Slaughterhouse-Five. Slaughterhouse-Five has been my go-to, what book should I read first, recommendation for years now. And I like what I've used as my description of the book for years too. Slaughterhouse is wacky and wildly entertaining. Anachronistic is an understatement for its storytelling method, and it works dazzlingly. It fleshes out ideas largely associated with stoicism really well, but it expands with a thesis of relatively small amounts of beauty are always worth the suffering that takes place around them. Or rather, everything was beautiful and nothing hurt. It recognizes the absurdity of an anti-war book and concept, as if those haven't been written, and as if they'd have any effect. So it doesn't do that. It mires in the absurdity of its reality and finds its identity clearly. It's entertaining as hell, too, and I was laughing at every so it goes by the end. I got to 14 entries on this list I was sure I wanted to include. This book was among many I could have picked for the last spot, but I chose to include it for its accessibility and effectiveness at getting anyone watching who isn't already into literature introduced to it. Number 14, Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin. One of my favorite aspects of fiction is its ability to create a sense of understanding, however imperfect compared to lived experience, as a sort of proxy for identities and experiences you can never really have in your real life. Giovanni's Room was able to do this for me in its assessment of bisexuality. Before reading this book, I never had any sort of grasp of the emotions inherent to this identity, and didn't at all understand that relations with one gender does not fulfill the same desire as another for people who are bisexual creating a sense of incompleteness within a monogamous world, especially when paired with ubiquitous homophobia. James Baldwin was able to capture these ideas, create reflection in me, and lead to some very inspired discussions with people I know in my own life who are bisexual, who could recount emotions and experience aligned with what I read, and deepen my understanding of the world and the people around me. This exploration was excellent and made Giovanni's Room one of the most palpable experiences I've had with books thus far. Number 13, The Magic Mountain by Thomas Mann. The Magic Mountain traces the adolescence of Hans Castorp within his plight of illness upon a vaguely magical setting which precludes seemingly inevitable death. Here, he meanders through a litany of conversations assessing much of the philosophies found in pre-war Europe. To me, the substance of the novel comes within its conversations and most notably addresses the nature of time and our perception of it the falsity of dichotomy as a concept, and how death serves as the background for any philosophical concept. Thomas Mann himself assesses the book's meaning as, What Hans came to understand is that one must go through the deep experience of sickness and death to arrive at a higher sanity and health. And I don't think I could put it any better than that, although maybe Father John Misty could. Number 12, Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. My introduction to love of literature came in Pride and Prejudice. A girl I was talking to on Tinder, of all things, told me how much she loved the book, and I'd always meant to read it, as Jane Austen was a favorite of a high school English teacher whom I thoroughly admired. I figured this was the perfect time. I really didn't expect Tinder to lead me to making lists like this on the internet, but hey, here we are. Pride and Prejudice is about, well, it's well titled. But I think its shine comes through in the personality of Lizzie. She's very lovable as a character, but it's her conflict with love that lends depth to her story. The plot is consumed in different examinations of courtship and the foundation of relationships across a gradient of validity in their strength. Lizzie learns through these as she watches, predicts to varying degrees of success, and tries to understand the means of successful love. Ultimately, she faces her own pride and her own prejudice, allowing for a mutual understanding-based relationship with Darcy. And I'm definitely here for it. Number 11, To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. To the Lighthouse is a short modernist novel which serves as an excellent entry point into the often challenging psychological expanse within the artistic movement's other works. The narrative is split into three distinct sections, which amount to set up with the window, a violent wind of artistic shock in Time Passes, and the search for an answer in The Lighthouse. Art in general reflects life and questions its meaning, but To the Lighthouse very directly asks what life's meaning is 
zeroing in on conflicting points of view shown within different archetypical characters. Within the style's allowance of deep yet efficient development and the mechanics of the story allowing for its expanse to coalesce within Lily, the novel is able to gain a surprisingly well-grounded, thorough point despite its short length. Number 10, A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man by James Joyce. My introduction to one of the literary canon's most fabled authors struck a surprising chord with me. The conflicts with religion as a cause of invalidation and fear within oneself, its stifling of personality and experience, as well as the core thematic thread of seeking art heavily mirrored my own experiences to an extent where I felt like I was reading my own life. Through Joyce's gorgeous writing style, filtered through a much more accessible prose than his work would go on to become, I felt seen. In my own life, religion was a failure for me, and art has succeeded where religion failed. Joyce's exploration of these conflicts, I think it's important whenever making or talking about any sort of list that you note where a sort of tear break is or where you transition from, ah, I could really see this number over that number to where you see a clear definitive difference when you are really leveling up in the quality of the thing that you're assessing. And this would be one of those tear breaks, the first of two that'll happen on this list. So number nine, The Trial by Franz Kafka. If only Kafka could have loved himself as much as everyone else loves him. He's fascinating. I think of him as the literary David Lynch, and he's one of the authors that's purely inseparable from the art form while being maybe the most true to it. The trial presents to us an unknowable, unending, unreasonable court case posed against Joseph K. The specter of this case feels dreadful, impenetrable, like a disease growing inside you that you're aware of but can do nothing about. It seems many others are all dealing with the same thing. And while most can live outside of their trial, Joseph struggles to. The trial, to me, is an allegory for death, and the most thorough allegory I've ever read. The book feels almost too precise, too perfect, like it's showing us some infallible truth of the world. And to me, it says that we must wrestle with God, whatever God may be to us, as it is often our own ability to live freely, creating our own meaning that precludes us from ever stepping up and actually finding one. The trial is a life wasted, arguing a verdict that was already known, one that has and always will be known. Number eight, 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. From the opening sentence of this book, I was in love. This is probably my favorite aesthetic work of art ever made. Every line is just dripping with style, and I couldn't ever go more than five pages without running into a sentence that had me fascinated for the rest of the day. The story is a microcosm for human history, one that's very true to the cultural formation of it. It presents mankind's history as one of oppression, plagued by the core conflict of an inability to truly love, which manifests as lust, greed, and war. The book is so passionate, so beautiful, so focused on the relationships within people sharing themselves against the backdrop of a hellish social landscape, but nobody ever feels honest, genuine connection. The book carries a mantle of emptiness across interactions among characters and a deep sense of longing within each as the historical timeline sprints them to their death before answers can ever be reached. The novel ends on an ambiguous tone, but I choose to read it optimistically. I don't think the validation of an answer to find the ability to love is thoroughly aligned, and if it were, it would likely end up much higher on my list. I'm tempted to put it higher anyways. I have much more personal affection for it than the next couple spots, but I want to stay consistent with my values of really zeroing in on how thoughts, ideas, emotions are tangibly explored towards some sort of ends. Number seven, War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. Maybe the most celebrated novel in literature is worth its extensive reading time. The story shines in Tolstoy's beautiful prose and intricate character workings across probably the most expansive cast on this list. There is peace within war, and there is war within peace. The sky stands above each as the view people take to search for meaning in their lives. These two seemingly opposite conflicts are best expressed within the two most central characters of the novel. And had their relationship and coalescence of these themes been closer, I would likely put this book even higher. Its blurred lines of fiction and history serve towards its point 
as Tolstoy argues for his perspective on the flow of time, that the world is dictated in the hearts of men, in an aggregate sense of spiritual longing and pursuit in fulfillment, rather than the actions of great men in historical events. It's a fascinating read, and I wish I could do it justice in such a short space. Number six, Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. The word subjective is a constant in discussions of art and anything derivative of it, morality included. This presents a problem, logically. If God is dead, if there is no objective meaning or morality to the world, then the logical conclusion is that we can do whatever we want, consequences to others be damned. However, Dostoevsky didn't believe this. And typical to his relationship with writing, he sets out to create a psychological evaluation of a character confronting these conflicts, but without any biases or holes to invalidate the point. Enter Raskolnikov, the OG Sigma male. Raskolnikov features as the heart and soul, but also the skin, eyes, and everything in between for this book. The more main character connected focus is why I prefer it to the prior entry. But it's in the questioning, and even more the answers, which Raskolnikov delivers that makes this story so timelessly valuable. Raskolnikov's story argues that although there isn't objective morality in our world, prototypically Christian virtue is good and just. There is a shared sense of love that exists among all people, which we inherently alienate ourselves from as we hurt and kill. Dostoevsky outlines the arguments for guilt and conscience within a larger portrait of the failings of Raskolnikov's essentially ubermensch philosophy. Raskolnikov is not above others and able to kill with impunity. Nobody is. This book really is more so crime and punishment, because that is its core focus. I mentioned there would be a second tier break on this list, where the quality really ramps up between entries, and this is that second tier break. It's funny because the next entry is also going to be a Dostoevsky work, and I feel very strongly that this is his strongest work. I think there is a significant difference in quality between this and the previous entry. So, here we are. The top five. Number five, The Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. The Brothers Karamazov serves as Dostoevsky's magnum opus, the coalescence of the ideas posited in his other master works. I like to think of the novel as a sort of atheistic Bible, which sounds counterintuitive because Dostoevsky was explicitly Christian. But the book itself isn't using, well, because God said so, as its argument, no. It seeks the truth and the inner peace Christianity seems to so easily lend to its believers, but through actual, tangible argument. The story makes a sort of contrapositive argument for God, whatever God may be, be it an omnipotent entity, the shared love of humanity, whatever, through its central characters. Be they the id, ego, superego, or a reflection of Dostoevsky's compartmentalization of himself. They reflect immutable archetypes of humanity and core conflicts inherent within it. The crux comes in the logical argument made in Ivan. Ivan is positioned as a genius, and his logic is foolproof throughout the book. He's never really incorrect. His central point of how can there be a good god if innocent children suffer and die is a brutal and difficult one. But the logic of Ivan is shown to clearly trace towards the horrible ends the book leads to, be it directly or not. And if we do not want such an inevitable outcome, then we follow Alyosha instead. Alyosha's character isn't as clearly defined, and I think borrows from the logic of Ivan a little too much. But through his intersections with his brothers, he's able to generate the final scene, giving a powerful answer in Ivan's premise, and giving the story its ultimate meaning. What's funny is the book was actually meant to be the first in a series that Dostoevsky didn't live to write. Ivan would have been the main character, and I can only imagine how amazing it could have been. One of the greatest losses to art's history as far as I'm concerned, but this book is nonetheless one of art's greatest achievements. Number four, Ulysses by James Joyce. Assessing Ulysses, especially as a normal person like me, not an academic or a genius, is a fool's errand. I'd be lying if I said I understood even close to the totality of Joyce's complexity. 
Although I spent more time reading analysis of this book than the book itself, I know that my next read will open doors for me in hallways that I didn't even think to turn my head to look down. All I can do is place it based on the merits I've been able to assess, and if you think it should be higher, I really won't fight you. Ulysses is realistically a continuation of Joyce's prior work. It's profoundly personal, Stefan being the image of Joyce himself and Bloom being, in my interpretation, his view on the truth of humanity's essence. The wonder of the book comes in how it's written. The stream of consciousness style is often considered as the most precise depiction of real human thought ever crafted, and through the constant beating of literary illusion and additional detail within the grammar, Joyce is able to imbue his words with as much volume, as much multidimensionality as real human thoughts have. Because of this, he's able to cover what feels like the truth of a man within a single day. Ulysses' topics pertain to science versus art and how this cascades throughout many of life's central conflicts, parallax being the idea of different pictures taken as different perspectives are used, and the thin veil between fatherhood and creation. To me, for all the complexity, chapters aligning scattered writing styles throughout all of history in a massive gestating metaphor, the most chaotic, trippy sequence ousting an inner world, and all the overwhelming grammatical detailing. Ulysses says one thing. Create. Number 3. In Search of Lost Time by Marcel Proust I've wanted to climb the tallest peak in literature since I was a kid. If you couldn't tell, I'm that annoying type who spends their time googling things like best books of all time, fascinated with the contents of these lists. So naturally, In Search of Lost Time has been in my plan to read for many years, being the number one on the aggregate site, along with having the hardest title I've ever heard. It was a much different experience than I expected, especially relative to my first time pondering its contents when I was a child. The Labyrinth of Proust is lined with seemingly mundane events, dressed in heady aphorisms and gorgeous prose, as he deeply reflects on the everyday. The book takes place more so in Proust's thoughts than it does Paris, or Balbec, or Cambrai. It feels more like a companion with your own inner monologue rather than a deliberate, contained narrative. In the six months I spent immersed in Proust's world, I felt his thoughts mixing with my own. And as much as I'd struggle to recall the minutia of every absurdly long, ironically lined salon conversation, the flavor of the book's marinade is baked within me. For such a Byzantine, colossal expose on everything you could possibly imagine, In Search of Lost Time is strangely well organized. We immediately watch the sublime beauty of a young boy finding peace in his mother folded over a man reflecting on how this broke her freedom, and that's ultimately a microcosm for the whole story. We follow Marcel cascade through childhood naivete, watching a blurred, ugly love story. An expedition to a magical place, standing in as the transition through childlike wonder and adolescent excitement of a new experience. And very quickly, we reach the stagnancy, the longing in adulthood. Marcel questions social success, romantic love, and finally, artistic inspiration as the paths to life's meaning. Eventually, in his twilight years, he understands the last path's ability to merge the whole, to fold the fabric of his life over, recreating the sublimity of his mother's kisses as he finds lost time in art just as the Madeleine had. The inexplicable moments of beautiful clarity, the connection of oneself to oneself across time, are the only viable weapons we have, spiritual weapons, to fight the intangible, unknowable antagonists of life. Time, boredom, erosion of love, the longing for an incoherent sense of more, and death. Marcel found his purpose in his remembrance of things past as he connects them together for us and creates the book for himself as his own answer. But hopefully Marcel's pages in the fabric of life can fold over upon us as well, as we all join him to endlessly search for our life and what it means in time. Up to this point, I've predominantly been talking about well-established, older, literary classics. But for the top two, I have 
some more unique choices, which I'm really happy with because they are honestly the two books that I feel most passionate about, have the most affection for, and I think are the best that I've read. So I'm excited to share them with you. Number two, The Birthgrave Trilogy by Tanith Lee. Our unnamed protagonist wakes up in a volcano with no memories. She is spoken to by the antagonist, an amorphous entity named Karakaz, who consistently urges her to kill herself, her hand being the only one in the world strong enough to kill her. The only knowledge Karakaz offers is that she's the last member of a race of, effectively, gods. She doesn't know why the rest of her race has died out or why she is here. She's told she should look for the Jade, a gem that would be her salvation. And she wears a mask as she's too alien and terrifying to look at with the eyes of man. She ventures on a journey of self-discovery as she sifts through different tribal societies and different men she outgrows time and time again. The story is a gendered exploration of power, going as far as to capitalize the word every time it's used. The first book ends on a transcendent climax, which revolutionizes our view of our main character and what the story has been about all along, before shifting points of view to her son, whose journey largely mirrors her own, much of the meaning in the series founded within the contrast of the two. Except, this time, his goal is more defined, vengeance on his mother who left him. The beauty of the book is largely founded in its character development, overlaid on world-building and archetypical side characters. Constant self-questioning and evocative internal monologue renders a detailed portrait of our point-of-view characters, allowing for impactful, resonant statements about gender, history, violence, and power to shine through each as we constantly question, will they ever meet? And number one, my favorite, in my opinion, the best, the most meaningful to me book that I have ever read, The Neapolitan Novels by Elena Ferrante. Art allows us to vicariously experience life through another's eyes, grounded in the artist's creativity and emotional expression. We can not only see, but feel the experiences that we'd never be able to actually live. Art shines through, revealing cracks in the idea that we only live once. The Neapolitan novels by Elena Ferrante elevate this idea to its peak. It's less art reflects life and more art is life. Elena shares a most intimate, nuanced, excruciating account of her thoughts and feelings over the course of her entire life. The mother-daughter relationship the precarious balance of love and competition found within women's best friends, and the pervasive patriarchal influence across different dimensions of experiences and relationships are some of the concepts I felt myself to better understand, having come to know Elena. On the surface, this story is a heart-wrenching, beautiful autobiography, but in truth, it's much more. This is a Proustian novel and employs the same folding over on itself tactic I discussed with Proust himself. However, Elena is much more focused. Elena exists in multiple dimensions. The first, Elena Greco, the character named for her classical pursuits, learning the past to better understand the future, as the novel itself is doing, exists on the linear narrative, but also as the detached old writer within the book itself. There is also Elena Ferrante, Ferrante being a pseudonym meaning old and gray, the name contrast immediately shaping our Proustian dynamic. The folding over time. The interplay among these different forms adds layers to the meaning of the lines we read. Elena writes to catalog her life, reshaping Naples in her own feminine image to her millions of readers affecting art over reality, exposing its patriarchal, violent realities, and bending them. But most importantly, we draw on Elena's self-ordained goal of becoming, as she puts it, and Leela's revelation that she can see the outlines between things. These outlines, in truth, are the gaps of understanding that exist within others as we each have our own shape, our own distinct identity inherently alienating of 
others. The last thing Leela tells Elena is although she can protect herself, she can't protect herself from her. The outlines between them have been erased, and we see this over the course of the book. Elena defines herself by means of Leela. Through writing the books, she achieves her goal of becoming, as she simultaneously recognizes the validity of her relationship with Leela, but is able to create her own outline. She connects all of the Elenas, as they exist across time and across the border of fiction and reality, forging her own shape, and she becomes Elena. This book is one of my favorite pieces of fiction, but it's one which feels less like fiction and more like a friend. And that's my list. Those are my top 15 books. I'm really excited to get through more. I'm really excited to do another version of this list in the future. I'm confident that many of these are always going to stay on my list, especially the top five. I cannot imagine that they will ever fall out of the top 15, as much as I'm aware that literature is expansive and I've really just dipped my toes in it so far. But I love what I've read so far. It's had a profound impact on me as a person. And I hope that you've read some of these as well and you love them as much as I do. Please comment down below what your favorite books on my list are, some books that mean the most to you, or what you think of my list overall. And thank you so much for watching. It means a lot. I'm really happy to be able to share myself and my passions with all of you. And if you haven't yet, like the video, subscribe, keep up with the channel for more content. Thank you so much.